people wonder, they look around the Jewish world today, and we know that Rabbi Andrusier just closed escrow a few weeks ago in this massive piece of property. And, and wherever you look, especially you go, if you happen to be in Florida, every time you get off a, 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 an exit on the freeway, and I was in February for a little speaking tour in Florida, yeah, there's another big Chabad center or they're building another Chabad center. And, and, and we, as one side of the Jewish community talks about that things are consolidating and getting smaller and things are deteriorating, for some wild reason, Chabad is not, it's going the opposite. It's growing and developing. And it, it, it's interesting because I got a phone call just from the uh, Jerusalem Post just a few days ago. And they're doing a story about how is Chabad faring 26 years later because in another two weeks or so, we're going to be marking the 26th anniversary of Gimel Thomas, the third of Thomas, the day the rabbi, the rabbi tragically left us physically. His teachings continue to, 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 to inspire us. And he's, he's living, in a sense, in every one of the Chabad centers that we have. After the Rebbe's passing, uh, I met a local Jew in a, in a hardware store, and he says, what's Chabad going to do? So I told him, you know that building I'm building down the block? He said, yeah, I know the building. I said, the Rebbe is going to live in that building. So Baruch Hashem, the Rebbe's ideas and his teaching continue to live in all the different Chabad centers you are. And people are wondering, the Jerusalem Post is writing this big story, why? How could it possibly be? So even though we look at all the good, we have to realize things were not always that way. I've been a shliach for some 40 some odd years. I started off at the University of Miami, where when I, when I landed in the early 70s in Florida, they looked at Chabad like a cute kind of, you know, fiddler on the roof. We'll make an evening. We'll have a little bit of fun. It'll be instead of, if I was a rich man, it'll come chassid. We'll tell some stories. It was cute. It's the old country. And suddenly it's a little different. But it was a, little, it was a lot different. And people didn't want to understand this. In 1973, Rabbi Yisrael Rubin was sent by the Rebbe to Albany, New York to start up Chabad. Nowadays, when Chabad comes to a town, it's very interesting. There's a JLI program, there's a C-teens, and there's, everybody's got a friend or a neighbor or a cousin that goes to another Chabad center, and usually a few miles away, there is a Chabad center. And so now it's like very popular. He rolls into Albany in 1973, I think it was, and the, scene, the, the leaders of the Jewish community said, who sent you here? We didn't ask you to come. He says, well, the Rebbe in Brooklyn sent me here to uplift Jewish life, to inspire, to educate, to serve the Jewish community. They said, we don't need you here in town, Rabbi. We got a Jewish community center. We got Temple Beth this, we got that. And there was a little Orthodox shtibel in town on the second floor of a house where on a Shabbos they'd serve a little bit of herring. And that was traditional Judaism in Albany. There was a sheichet in town, a guy who would slaughter kosher meat. And he had a little minion around him, but that was basically traditional Judaism. They said, we don't need you in this town. What are you doing here? And he says, well, the Rebbe sent me. Now, if you go to Albany, you'll find Chabad houses, you'll find day schools, you'll find campus centers all around the region and they're, and they're around the capital of, of, uh, of New York State. There's a, a wealth of programs of Chabad. It was a lot different. And he's there for a couple of months, for six months. And you know how Chabad works. Every center has got to support itself. He's got to find that local involvement. And finally, one day, he gets a check in the mail for $300. Now, $300... In the early 70s, like two, 3,000 bucks today. Now, let me tell you something. Never send a check to a Chabad rabbi. Because if you figure you're going to get rid of this guy by sending him a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, it ain't going to work that way. He's coming back next Thursday. Then he's bringing his wife, then his children, and then his grandchildren. You got him stuck for life. It's the worst thing he could possibly do. But he sends this guy. He gets his check for $300. Reuben is all excited. I got a donor finally. Somebody's interested in what I'm doing in this town. All the Jewish elders. I remember when I first came as a shlia. Oh, we don't need you here. What are you doing here? We didn't hire you. Our board of directors is having meetings. They don't need you. They don't want you. So he calls the guy up and he says, Mr. Stein, whatever his name is, I got your check. I want to meet with you. He says, Rabbi, don't meet with me. He says, I'm so touched you sent me this check. Again, $300 in that, some 40 some odd years ago, it was, you know, it's a long time ago, it was a lot of money. He says, Rabbi, let me tell you what happened. We had a betting pool. I said, if you last six months, you get $300. The point is we had a betting pool in town from all the bachers in the Jewish community. Well, you seem to be lasting. Those days, things were different. 
And today, there's a revolution in the Jewish world. When I wrote my book, The Secret of Chabad, I was trying to figure out what to call it. So I went to see a friend of mine, and uh, <clears throat> it was a bit known, a talk show host, Dennis Prager. I was sitting in his house one day. I said, Dennis, what am I going to call this book? So he says, inside the world's most successful Jewish movement. I said, come on, Dennis, that's pretentious. He says to me, Reb David, it's true. And so today, Chabad today, Baruch Hashem, is a global powerhouse. We're in 107, 108 countries. But the question is, what's in our guts? What's in our kishkas? Why is this happening? Why are you going to Chabad? You know, I, was, I spoke once someplace in central Florida. I think it was somewhere north of Orlando. It was a center for, for all kinds of seniors. So, the, so somebody asked me a question about Chabad. So I asked them, these are all people 65, 75, 85, 95, 120. So it was ein Gesundheit is 120. And I said, how many of you people would have dreamt 25 years ago that you'd be regularly involved with the Chabad Center? And hardly anybody raised their hand. So things have changed in the Jewish world. So how did, what did the Rebbe really do here? And I want to tell you what I told the reporter for the Jerusalem Post just a few days ago, and I spoke to him again yesterday. The Rebbe came with revolutionary ideas. Chabad is a movement of ideas. It's a movement of big thoughts, big concepts. And what's driving us today is the teachings of the Rebbe. So he asked me, what, 26 years later? I said, yes, it's the Rebbe's ideas, which were revolutionary. And some of them we know intuitively. Some of them we, some of them we have a sense what they are. And why I want to share with you this, e this evening what I believe are the Rebbe's six big ideas. Now, one of the things you're going to learn about Chabad is every Chabad rabbi has his own opinion. Probably one of the rabbis on this, on this what's his name, is going to tell me there's eight ideas. The other guy's going to say there's four ideas. That's good. We're all individualists. But, but the Rebbe had six different, six, in my mind, big ideas. And, and those ideas have revolutionized modern Jewish life. And all parts of the Jewish community are borrowing those ideas from us, from the most liberal end to the most traditional end, because we have ignited a spark, which is transformation. So let me take you back in history, because to understand what happened, we got to step back a little bit. In January 1950, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Yesef Yitzhak Schneerson, the father-in-law of the Rebbe, who was in his, in his own right a heroic figure. He's the man who stood up to communism, was sentenced to death. He's the man who came to America and said, America is not different. We're going to change Judaism in America. He's the man who built a secret network of a Jewish underground in Russia that kept Judaism alive until the fall of the Soviet Union. He was a revolutionary figure. And to, be, and, and to give a shameless plug, he's going to be the, he is the subject of my next book, which I'm working on as we speak every morning, which is, is going to be called Undaunted, is a biography of the previous Rebbe, a revolutionary figure. January 1950, he passes away. And the question is, what's going to be further? Who's going to be the next Rebbe? And the Hasidim, they begin to lobby because the relationship between Chassid and Rebbe is a voluntary, it's a voluntary uh, relationship. Nobody's obligating, nobody's imposing. It's, it's something that, it's a choice. They begin to lobby the Rebbe's son-in-law, the Ramash, who is called, at that time is called the Ramash, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, after his name, that he should accept the position of Rebbe, and he resists it. He hesitates, he doesn't want. And by the way, if you look at the history of Chabad Rebbe's, this is actually the norm. It took, many times the Rebbe's waited a while before they accepted that position of Rebbe. It's an awesome responsibility. Finally, a year later, comes the night when he's going to either accept that position or not. On the first yard site, the first anniversary of the passing, 10th of Shvat, the 10th of the Jewish month of Shvat, January 1951, there's a Hasidic gathering of Abrengen upstairs in the shul in 770. Now, many of you may have been to 770. And may many of you not. And you have this image of this large synagogue. But in those days, it was a three-story brownstone. And when you walked in, until today, you walk in that main entrance. And right after the office, you hang a right, you find a sanctuary, a synagogue. It is 620 square feet. It's tiny. In that room of 620 square feet, I've got a lobby here in our building that's over 700 square feet. Because why do you need a lobby in a shul? Because people have to go to davening. So during davening, they got to have some place to go to talk. So we made a very large lobby, so there's lots of room to talk. Nevertheless, the whole room was 620 square feet, and there and the Rebbe had the, 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 till then the Ramash, the Rebbe, who becomes the Rebbe that night. He had been doing Fabrengen's Hasidic gatherings since he arrived in the United States in 1941. 
because his father-in-law had told him to do so. And that's how people got to know him and were amazed at his scholarship and his brilliance and, his, and his, the vast sense of knowledge he had. But the question is, would he become that knight of Rebbe? So he comes into the room and the Fabrengen begins. And after a little while, one of the older Hasidim says, the talks are wonderful, but we want a mimer. Now, what is a mimer? A mimer is a Hasidic discourse, a deep, esoteric, mystical teaching of the Kabbalistic concepts of Judaism as articulated in Hasidic philosophy. And the only one who says a Rebbe, a, a mimer, is a Rebbe, is a Rebbe. So if you're a Rebbe, you say a mimer, and if not, not. It's like, an, it's like the State of the Union address, so to speak, at a spiritual kind of level, and a Rebbe would do it almost every week, or every two weeks, or three weeks, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the Chassidim says, the Sichas Dov Zayin Dachshin, a Medav Ho Meimer, and a Mimer, we want to hear a Mimer. So the Rebbe says, he does, to, he, but he starts before the Mimer, he does something very important. He says, it's a custom in America. I'm thinking he's saying this in Yiddish. That before we begin something new, and he says, as we make the statement, that we make a statement. And at the end of the sentence in, in Yiddish is this word, statement. Now, what do we got over here? It's the mission statement. And what does he say? And this is what's so powerful and so important. He says, in Judaism, we have three loves. We have three foundational principles of loving. Number one is, Abbas Hashem, we have to love God. Because the central idea of being a Jew is having a relationship with the one above. That's what it means as to being a Jew. The second thing is, Abbas Atayra, to love Torah. And the third thing is, Abbas Yisrael, to love your fellow Jew. So, and then comes the, so to speak, what we call in America, the kicker. He says, you can have that love of God. You can sit, I'm paraphrasing the Rebbe's words a little bit now here. So it didn't exactly say it this way, but I'm adding, I'm embellishing. I just want to be true to the, to, to the Rebbe's words. And you could sit and pray the whole day, connect to the one above. You could have all these spiritual insights. You can have that Abbas Atayra. You can have that love of Torah. You can spend your whole life in Jewish scholarship. And we're living in a remarkable time where thousands and thousands of Jews are immersing themselves in Jewish scholarship. There's never been a period in Jewish history that so many Jews have been studying Torah. But he says, if you don't have Abbas Yisrael, if you're not concerned for the welfare of your fellow Jew as much as you are concerned for yourself, something wrong with your love of God and something's wrong with your love of Torah. There's a story told about a Paritz. A Paritz was back in Europe. There was an old big landowner and he owned, uh, had his castle and some knights and some soldiers and he owned the land. The local Jew had to be, had, you know, was dependent on him. He rented a little space from him. He rented an inn from him. And the Paritz, the, the noblemen, they, a bunch of them got together one day and they said they needed economic stimulus tablets, a PPT, PPP program. They got to get the economy moving. So they were going to make a big market. And this is before there was all the different choices we have today for entertainment. And there was no baseball and no football, even though Nebuch now, a, a friend of mine told me today, we have to start baseball to get America back on its feet. But... They decided that they're going to have a, 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 a big market. People are going to come from all over Poland and they're all going to sell their wares. And to give a little sense of attraction, each one of the noblemen will capture a bear and teach the bear to do tricks. And the one, the bear that does the best tricks will win the prize, you know, the gold award for his little feudal state. So our portraits, our nobleman goes back to his castle and he goes into the forest. He sends some soldiers, he cap captures a bear. He tries to teach the bear to do tricks. And as I say in Yiddish, his gate it doesn't work too well. So what does he do? He calls in his local Jew who works for him. Yankel, Yankel is terrified. The Paritz is calling me. The rich man, the nobleman, I'm defending. My whole life is, livelihood is dependent on him. He says, did you hear about the big marketplace, market they're going to have? The big fair? He says, yes. You heard about the competition, about the, about the bears? He said, yes. He says, Yankel, I got good news for you. He says, what's that? He says, you're going to be the bear. So they bring in a tailor, a lord and tailor, whatever they bring the tailor in. They teach him again, dress him up as a bear. They teach him the mannerisms of a bear. He begins to scream and roar like a bear. The big day comes and there's a, gig there's a gigantic cage surrounded by thousands of people and they throw Yankala in and he acts like a bear and he pounds and he moves. And I don't know if anybody's been ever seen a grizzly bear up in Yellowstone. I've seen black bears in Yellowstone National Park, but, uh, uh, but uh, you know, a big bear, and then on the other side of the cage, there's another bear. And Yankel thinks to himself, if that bear realizes I ain't no bear, I am toast, I am history. 
What happens is the other bear starts walking toward Yankala. So what does a Jewish bear do the last moment of his life? He takes his paw, he puts it over his eyes, and he screams out, Shema Yisroel, Hashem Eloteinu, Hashem Echad. And the other bear answers, Baruch, Shem, Kavoy, Machuse, Lo'oilo, Bo'ed. What the Rebbe wanted us to do to stop looking at the externals and look at the spiritual core of every single human being. And to realize we all had a common sense of divinity. We may look different, we may think different, we may act different, but at the very essence of us is a godly soul. And by the way, this is a very powerful message for the challenges and difficulties that American society is going through now. Because when we look at another person, we don't see a different color, we don't see a different heritage, we don't see a different ethnicity, we see a sense of a divine spirit that exists in every single human being. So the Rebbe's first teaching was, how do we look at other people? How are we going to, 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 um, to how are we gonna, how are we gonna look at other people? We also, and, 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 and uh, how are we gonna look at other people? The second thing is, at the end of that Fabregen, came a very, another very powerful idea, which is, how do we serve God? You know, you go to Shul, and the Rebbe gave a, a, a very important statement. And this was another very, the second most important, the second big idea, so to speak. He said, he, what, he, what he said like this, he explained his role. He says, I'm here, I can't do for you. I'm not here, I can't do anything for you. What I can do is I can give you advice, I can give you inspiration, I can give you maybe some direction, but you have to do the heavy emotional lifting yourself. It's called a concept in, in, Kabbalah, in, in Hasidic terminology, you have to serve Hashem with your own efforts. You have to serve Hashem with your own efforts. What does that mean? There's a very interesting thing in the Chabad world. The greatest praise that you can give one Hasid to another, one rabbi to another, is not to say he's a great scholar. That's not, that may be true. But to say he's a pnimi. The word pnimi means something Something, somebody who has internalized the ideas of Judaism. In other words, what's on the outside is not, is what's, on the in, what's on the inside is on the outside. Because listen, you know, you can come into shul on Shabbos and you can sing, Adon, Olam, and you can feel inspired. That's an external inspiration. The trick is to be inspired from your inner spiritual gut. That's something much more challenging. And what the Rebbe was telling his chassidim is that I want you to be inspired from the inside, that's what's going to happen. I want you to go to the very essence of who you are. There was a reform rabbi called Herbert Wiener. He wrote a book called Nine and a Half Mystics, a very in intriguing read, and I encourage you to find it. You can find it, I think you probably find it on Amazon. It was published late 60s, early 70s. Spent an extensive amount of time with the Rebbe. And one day he says to the Rebbe, listen, aren't you just creating a bunch of robots? You say what to do and they go ahead and do it. And the Rebbe gave him a very interesting answer. He says, send them where, uh, I, if you, I'll send them to wherever they're going to go and they'll remain true to who they are. It's no big kunz to live as a chassid in Brooklyn. I have two kids who live in Melbourne, Australia. Whenever I go to Melbourne, I move into the Orthodox community. I have a regular place in the shul. I'm very comfortable. I have a good time. And it's natural. Judaism in Melbourne is one of the most dynamic and successful Jewish communities in the world. I would argue in a regular democratic country, it is the most successful Jewish community in the world for many reasons. I want to have another lecture about Jew modern Jewish life and talk about Melbourne, we'll do it another night. But I just, everything there is just so easy. You can buy, you know, everything is easy. But when you go and you live in distant Jewish communities all over the world and you educate your children, that's when something has seeped inside and deep inside. And you know where you see this most amazingly? is in the children of the Chabad Shluchim. Because think about it, they're being brought up in a total open society. They're not in, in Jerusalem, they're not in B'nai Brak, they're not in Borough Park, and they're not in Crown Heights. They're exposed to the whole diversity of the world. But what animates and motivates them is the internal values that their parents had. I saw this Friday night. I was sitting at the Shabbos table, and my daughter has come from San Francisco with her six kids, and, uh, and, and my wife says, no, somebody's gonna say Advar Torah. And my 15-year-old granddaughter, almost 16, she's, getting, she's, going, she's going for a learner's permit tomorrow, which is a momentous event for a teenager. And uh, she starts explaining all kinds of profound theological ideas as the Rebbe was teaching. Why? Because this idea has been internalized. 
it goes to the very essence that you're going to motivate yourself. And by the way, this also trickles down to the Chabad business model in a very intriguing way. Because Chabad institutions are built on an entrepreneurial model. A lot of wonderful Jewish organizations, they do great stuff, and they work in a consensus fashion. They sit around, they have a lot. I'm on a lot of boards and committees. I'm on the committee of the local Jewish federation. I'm on this committee and that committee. And they have meetings, and there's a meeting. They decided the meeting to have another meeting, and the third meeting, they have a fourth meeting. The Chabad, it's, the Shliach works in partnership with this community. It's an entrepreneurial model. He takes that ultimate responsibility. Why? It goes back to the same thing. Personal empowerment. The Rebbe empowered his chassidim to serve God in a powerful, internalized kind of way. And he also empowered us, even on a business model, to take a sense of responsibility and be driven by that. So that was the, that was the what's his name? That was the Rebbe's second big idea. And, 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 and now I want to take, but there's still a dilemma. The question is, what else do you want? Because the Rebbe didn't just want people who would say, okay, I love everybody, or you know what, I'll serve God. He wanted something revolutionary. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who's the chief rabbi of England, and the year my book came out, two and a half, three years ago, he won the National Book Award because he has the name Lord in front of him, and I was the runner-up, number two. It's the Jewish Pulitzer Prize. So I'm actually working with the Queen now. I'm trying to navigate the next book that comes out. I should have a title, so by then I'll for sure win the National but he said a very interesting thing, Rabbi Sachs. He said, good leaders create followers. Great leaders create leaders. And the Rebbe wanted leaders. He wanted people that would take responsibility. In the early 70s, the Rebbe wanted to give to Chabad in Israel a kickstart. Chabad had been growing and developing and expanding. But, you know, the guys who were, the young men and women who were brought up in Brooklyn, who were immersed in that culture and the Hasidic Fabringens and the energy and the passion, they had oomph that was lacking a little bit in Israel. He wanted to raise those horizons. So he sent 25 young couples, young primarily American couples, another 20 so old rabbinical students to Israel to give Chabad in Israel what I believe was a kick in the pants, a zetz, as they call it in Yiddish, to propel it forward. And those people today, many of them play very important leadership roles around the country. This one is the chief rabbi of this city and the chief rabbi of that city, big institutions and schools. They really were transformational. One of them is a dear friend of mine, Rabbi Mendel Glukowski, who today is one of the leaders of the Chabad Rabbinical Court in Israel. And he comes to Israel, he comes there, he gets, he gets married, and he begins to work as an assistant to a very famous chassid called Reb Zusha der Partizan. Reb Zusha der Partizan. Reb Zusha the Partizan was Reb Zusha Vilamovsky, who was a go-to guy for Chabad in Israel. And if you ever went watch the movie uh, Defiance, we learned, you, learned, you studied about, you heard about the Belsky Partizans. He had been one of those Partizans in the, in the, in the forest in Poland in World War II. So the Chassidim always called them Reb Zusha the Partizan. And so this elder, elder Chassid is mentoring this younger rabbi, and he's helping him out. And they're given a job, a mission, to travel in Israel, and to visit all the Chabad institutions and to see what's going on and write a report to the Rebbe in New York to get an evaluation. So they go from the north to the south. Now today we have like some 700 institutions in Israel. But in the late 1970s, it was a lot smaller. It was tiny compared to today. Today, wherever you go, there's another Chabad house, there's a school, there's a library, there's a this, there's a that. There's summer camps, there's youth programs all over the country. We are, we are and, and we are in Israel, we'll talk about it a little bit later, we're not a political party or anything like that. We're there for the welfare of the, of the, of the population. So what happens is, he does, does, does his whole trip, and he had to go to New York, so he was tasked with the responsibility, and he wrote an eight-page report to the Rebbe. Here is our situation. We went to the city of Ashkelon, and everything is fantastic. We went to Afula, and the cholent that they serve in the shul on Shabbos is a disaster. The school here in this town is okay, and the school in this town has a problem. They listed all the good, all the bad, and a whole list of problems, and they asked the Rebbe, what should they do? And he gives in this letter to the Rebbe, and he figures, okay, he's going to get an answer in a few days. Nothing. He's there in New York a week, garnish, nothing. Finally, he's getting in the taxi to go to JFK to go home. His brother calls him out from the window in his house, Mendel. They just called from the Rebbe's office. There's an answer for me. On the way to JFK, he stops at the Rebbe's office. And the way the Rebbe would give answers, primarily in those days, sometimes he would send letters, is on the side of your note, he would answer an answer. He would, he would write an answer. 
And the Rebbe writes in Hebrew, and I'm translating to English, he says, all the things that he writes about are very important. And the question is, what is he going to do about it? My dear friend Mendel copies this down. He jumps on the plane. He thinks to himself, what does this mean? What am I going to do about it? And over the Atlantic, he has an epiphany. He says, I felt till then like a spectator in the stands, and I'm watching the game being played on the field. And the Rebbe is saying to me, listen, I didn't send you in Israel to go sit in the stands and watch the game. I sent you there to get on the field and play the game. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to be responsible? How are you going to be an agent to change? So Rabbi Sachs said that Rebbe didn't want followers. He wanted people to take responsibility. He wanted people to become leaders. He wanted to empower them with that sense of leadership. And that was the Rebbe's third big idea. But when you come to leadership, there's always a dilemma. Because you don't know to, how do you do the right thing, how do you do the wrong thing. You know, when you're sitting, you know, in every show, there's three guys in the back row. They're reading the New York Times and they're telling the, they're tell, they think they're running the world. The prime minister in Israel should do this. The president should do that. The Congress should do that. The rabbi, of course, they have 14 opinions what the rabbi should be doing. And they think they're fearing on the guns of health. They, they, run the whole, they, run, they run the whole world. Because, but the real people that have leadership and responsibility, they have to make difficult decisions. And you don't always know what is the right and what is the wrong. In the early, uh, in the early 1960s, the Rebbe began slowly to dispatch rabbis, and they didn't send rabbis, they sent rabbis and Rebbitsons to communities, which was, by the way, one of the most, uh, uh, there was a rabbi in Rebbitson that he sent to Minnesota, a Moshe Mindy fellow. A fellow is still in Minnesota, standing on the guard. His wife, tragically, Mindy, passed away, I think about a year and a half, two years ago. But I want to tell you about the meeting they had with the Rebbe when they were about to go out as Shluchim, I think it was 1961, 62. They were going to go out. They were the fourth couple that the Rebbe sent out in the United States. Now, again, this is a very intriguing thing because Chabad is so different than every other Jewish organization. You hire a rabbi for your synagogue. You, may, you want to know if she has a nice Rebbe in. You want to know she's sweet and she's wonderful, et cetera, et cetera. But in Chabad, the rabbi sent a couple, a husband and a wife. And if you go on every website of Chabad.org, your local Chabad center, you'll say Rabbi, Ying, Rivka, rabbi Yitzchak and Rebbe in Rivka, whatever it is, directors and here was a very powerful thing the Rebbe did he empowered the Reb, the women with leadership and with responsibility and we have a very interesting thing in Chabad every year we have in November time a few weeks before Hanukkah we have a conference of the rabbis and Baruch Hashem I was at the first con I've been to every single conference the first one we had 47 people if I'm correct 47 people and Baruch Hashem last year we had over 5,000 I don't know how many guys have been at every single conference. Maybe the five of us that have done that should get a special award. But nevertheless, I've been to everyone, including the first one. And there's a couple months later in February, on the yard side of the Rebbe's wife, the Rebbetson, there is another conference for the Rebbe, for the women. So when the men are in New York, the movement is running just fine. But when the women come, and every guy's back home trying to take care of his Chabad house, take care of his kids, and balance all the responsibilities, the whole thing is hang, hanging by a, a thread and they're waiting for the women to get back. Because Chabad was always a partnership between the husband and the wife, between the rabbi and the rebbe that shared in the responsibility of Jewish leadership. Because one of the revolutionary things that Chabad did was empower women with the power of leadership. But let me tell you what happened in that meeting with Rabbi Feller and his wife, Mindy, Moshe Feller and Mindy Feller, they go into the rebbe. They come in. And this is his life mission. He's going for good. He had actually been brought up in the Twin Cities. His father was a used car dealer who closed on Shabbos. Now, everybody knows when do people buy cars. It's the weekend. But he was a, one of the only really religious Jews in all the town, all of Minneapolis. Uh, St. Paul, I'm sorry. And they go in. And he, the Rebbe doesn't say a word to Rabbi Feller. He turns to his wife, Mindy, who, had, who had, was a Phi Beta Kappa in mathematics who had landed a job as an a professor, assistant professor at the University of Minnesota to teach mathematics. And the whole conversation is how she should use her influence in the academic world to inspire and the other Jewish academics and students at the university to connect them with their Jewish heritage. And this goes on for a while. And Moshe Fell is standing there, garnished, nothing. The Rebbe says nothing to him. 
And finally, the Rebbe says to him, one single sentence. He says, Moshe, you have a copy of the Code of Jewish Law? And then the Rebbe rattles off the names of a few books which are classics in Jewish law. And then he says to me, he says, Moshe, flexible. You should, Moshe, you should be flexible. What's he telling him? You got to copy the Code of Jewish Law. You got to keep the rules. But you got to be flexible. You got to be creative. It's a balancing act. When you're living in Brooklyn and you got kosher ice cream here and kosher pizza there and everything is, and you, you can buy yourself a black hat on this street, on this Kingston Avenue or in that hour in Borough Park on 13th Avenue. Everything is very simple. But when you're living in the broader world and you're always meandering between the, this world and the next world, what Soloveitchik used to say, the great Ryosha Ber Soloveitchik, that we are both, we are in this world, but we're out of this world because the values of Judaism are supposed to animate us how you navigate these two different, your Jewish identity and the society around you, when you're part of that society, is much more challenging. And what he was telling him is that you have to keep the principles of Judaism, but at the same time, you have to be creative and dynamic. I think it was 1979, I'm not sure. There was the Iranian hostage crisis. And, and Jimmy Carter was the president and the guy was very depressed. And the truth is, we as Jews in particular have been very depressed about Jimmy Carter ever since then, but that's another story. And he was locked up in the White House, for those who remember, who are old enough to remember. And Rabbi Avram Shemtev was one of the senior leaders in the Chabad movement, had organized a lighting of a Hanukkah menorah in front of the White House, and they had invited the President of the United States, and the first time only, the President of the United States came out of the White House to participate in the light house and the menorah lighting. Now we have a menorah lighting in the White House, and who gives the kosher supervision in the White House is my friend, his son, Rabbi Levi Shemtov. I'm not saying that the policies of the White House are in Chabad supervision, but one day a year, the food in the White House is underneath Chabad supervision. But this was different. So President Carter comes outside to the park. I, uh, to, I, I forgot the name of the park, out opposite the White House. They have the big menorah there. That's why a live audience, somebody would already be correcting me. That would be, you know, that'd be very helpful. I forgot the name of the park. And he comes out there. It's the fifth night of Hanukkah. They have the giant menorah. And, and don't forget, Chabad is today, not what it is, you know, today is a lot different world than it was in those days. Today, Chabad is massive. In those days, Chabad was a much smaller movement. The president of the United States came to a menorah lighting. At the time, we were fighting a battle because many liberal Jewish organizations said we shouldn't light a menorah on public property. It's an infringement of church and state. The barrier between church and state, which, by the way, does not say in the Constitution of the United States that there should be a wall of, between church and state. That's in the writings, if I'm correct, of, uh, of a letter that I think either Jefferson or Madison wrote. It's not even in the Constitution of the United States, those words. And you shouldn't be doing it. And we, they were suing us all over the country. I, I put up Hanukkah menorahs here in California, and I got sued by the American Jewish Congress, which now doesn't really function anymore as an organization. They were a little, they tried to sue me. God forbid we should put a menorah up in a public place. They had nothing better to do. Anyway, president coming to menorah lighting is a really big deal. So it's the fifth night of Hanukkah, and he was very depressed because of the hostage crisis that ran. And the, and the Rabbi Shemtov turns to him and says, Mr. President, we're going to light five candles. So he says to him, Rabbi, why can't we bring more light into the world? Why are we only lighting five candles? Let's light all eight. And Shemtov has a dilemma. It's, it's, he thinks to himself, I, mean, I would imagine that's what he thought to himself. This is a rabbinic commandment. It's not a biblical commandment. This is not like eating, you know, uh, eating food on Yom Kippur. It's not a mitzvah for that. It's a rabbinic tradition to light the Hanukkah menorah. He says, and he's trying to figure out what to do. He doesn't want to offend the president of the United States. So he finally turns to him and says, Mr. President, we have two menorahs. One is the big one up here on top. We have a small menorah that we're putting in a glass case. It was windy. And we have a kid here, a child under bar mitzvah. Let's ask this kid to light the menorah. So he says, ah, Rabbi, that's a great idea. So the kid lights the menorah. Everything is fantastic. The president of the United States came to menorah lighting project sponsored by Chabad. And Rabbi Shemtov writes a report to the Rebbe telling him what happened. What could be a greater achievement? And the Rebbe writes him back. And Rabbi Shemtov shared it with us, the rabbis. And I think it's a very powerful lesson. And he tells him like this, I thought you would have had the Gaon Yaakov. I thought you would have had the strength of character to keep true to Jewish tradition. We don't even change your rabbinic tradition 
for the President of the United States. And that's what the Rebbe was telling Rabbi Feller. Keep the rules, but be open-minded. But don't compromise Judaism for anybody and anything. And this brings us to a much deeper issue, which is the Rebbe's fifth idea, which is something we all struggle with. How do we live in a Western modern society and at the same time remain true to our values of Judaism? You know, we go back in Europe 150 years ago, or if you lived in Morocco, or you lived in Tunis, we didn't have the freedom and opportunity of this country. And I believe, without question, in American exceptionalism, that America is the greatest country in the history of mankind. It's not a perfect country. It has its weaknesses, its flaws. That it, 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 historically, we would call it a Medina Shalchesed, a country of compassion. It's a country that respects the right of man. And with all its weaknesses and flaws, I believe it's a very remarkable place. And here, we can do whatever we want. We have an assistant secretary, I think, of one of the major uh, in a government agency, a Hasidic Jew. You can live your life here in this country. You can be religious, you can be secular, you can be Jewish, you can be Indian, you can be black, you can be white. You can do this, we add anything you want in this country, just keep the rules, the rule of law, and you can do whatever you want. So when you lived in the shtetl, in a little village back in Poland, and you might have been lucky to travel 50 miles in your life, and there was a Tsar who oppressed you, or a king, or a, or a noble lord, or you lived in Morocco and you had no real freedom, or you lived in, in Spain 500 years ago and you faced oppression or whatever, or even Napoleon, when he wanted to give Jews freedom in France in the early 1800s, he says, I'll give you freedom, but you gotta be good Frenchmen. It's a conditional kind of freedom. Here we can do whatever we want. And the question is, how do we balance these two things? How do we live in a modern world and at the same, at, at, at the same time, we, we remain true to our, va our values? So there's been different responses in the Jewish world. Parts of the Jewish community have said, you know what? That's, that society is a little bit dangerous. I'm gonna withdraw from it. I'll cross the moat. I'll go out and do a job, but I'm really not gonna be an active member of the society. Other parts of the Jewish world have said, you know what? Like the values of Western society, we'll dress them up and we'll call them the values of Judaism. The first is an act of insecurity, and the second is an act, of, an act of capitulation. What did Chabad come along with a remarkable approach? Our approach of principled engagement. We will deal with the world around us, but like oil on top of water. We'll be immersed in society, but we'll retain our distinct qualities and let Torah and Judaism animate how we live our lives. And you know where you really see this so interestingly? And this, before I, really, this is a radical approach of self-confidence because so many Jews are unsure of their identity. They're afraid to be assertive because you know that old joke that Jackie Mason would say, don't be too Jewish or we'll upset the non-Jews or it isn't a good idea. But comes Chabad and says, no, we can be proud, strong Jews and we can be active members of the world around us. That idea of principled engagement comes when we've internalized the values of Judaism. And you know where we see Chabad doing this in, 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 in so importantly is in Israel. Israel Chabad has a very interesting role. First, we are the only religious group that is not a political party. You have, thank God, so many political parties there. You know, you know, in America, we got the Democrats and the Republicans. In Israel, you got this one, you got that one, you got new parties every time. You know, there's always parties, elections every six weeks. It's a lot of fun. And the only religious group that does not have a party and easily could have a bunch of seats in the Knesset is Chabad, because we play a very different kind of role in Jewish history, in, in Israeli society. And I learned this in a very interesting story that happened to me about two, three years, about two years ago, three years ago, maybe. I'm a member of the board of the Jewish Agency for Israel. In fact, probably the first Haredi Jew, for first, first Chabad rabbi to be on the board of the Jewish Agency, which is, it was the agency that established the state of Israel and today does very important work all over the world in, in promoting Israel, Jewish education, connecting Jews to Israel, Aliyah to Israel, and many, many other things. And we, we, for, we, we, had to, we had to go to a series of meetings in the Knesset. Our, we have meetings a few times a year. In fact, our meeting is scheduled for October. I hope we're going to be able to go to Israel for the meeting. These board meetings go on for three days at a time. We have representatives of all of world Jewry coming, about 150 people from across the globe. And we had to go to the Knesset for a series of meetings. And there had been a Knesset member who had said some stuff very critical of Chabad. And I had been very upset with her. So I sent her an email. I want to meet with her. 
So I come to her office and thank God politics in Israel is a lot different than politics in America. I came into her office, she yelled at me, I yelled at her, we had, we had therapy together, it was fantastic. And because of that, I missed the bus back to the, the hotel on the other side of Jerusalem. And I'm walking through the lobby of the Knesset with this, two, if you know anything about the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, there's the public area and the private area. The private area is only for guests and members of the Knesset. In fact, the biggest action in the state of Israel, let me tell you where you gotta go. It's called the Miznon Knesset, which is the Knesset cafeteria. You sit there for five minutes and all the leaders of the country are there. That's where all the biggest business takes place. So I'm walking through the lobby of the private area of the Knesset and I'm wearing a badge that says Jewish Agency for Israel. I'm a little bit, what happened with the bus? It left. So a guy says to me, are you with the Jewish Agency? I said, yeah, I'm with the Jewish Agency. He says, no, I'm, go you, I'm going to the meeting. You need a ride? I said, yeah. I'll say, oh, thank you very much. I said, me, Ata, who are you? He says, Hashem Shali Itzik. Classic Israeli guy. You think he's like one of those contractors. Hashem Shali Itzik. I'm Itzik. I'm a member of the board of the Jewish Agency. Okay, we start schmoozing. Who are you? I am the mayor of the city of Ramad Gan. The vice mayor of Ramadan, not the mayor. Ramadan's a big city near Tel Aviv. We get in the car. I see there's two things he has that I don't have. Number one, he has a schlepper. You know what the schlepper is? Guy's carrying his bag. Number two, he has a driver. So I don't have no driver and I don't have no schlepper. He's got both. I figured he must be a little bit important. So I turn to him and I say, no, which party are you in? He says, Ani chaber Meretz. I'm a member of the Meretz party. Now, between me and you, in the last election or so, I think Meretz is basically falling apart. But in those days, this is two years ago, three years ago, Meretz was still pretty strong. Meretz is the left-wing party that makes Bernie uh, Th Sanders look like a Republican. You can't go further left than them. They want to give up everything except their own homes. So I say, interesting. I start talking to him. You know, Jew's a Jew. I don't care what his party is. We connect to each other. Then he tells me, he says, you know what responsibility I have in the city of Ramad Gan? I said, no. I'll tell you in Hebrew for those who understand Hebrew. Yeshli tatik shul chabad. The tik, a tik in Hebrew, when you use it in, the, in a political sense, means I'm the minister for chabad in the city of Ramad Gan. I'm thinking to myself, here is a super lefty. He's responsible for all the work of chabad and Ramad Gan. This is really wacko. So I said, what's going on? He says, listen. We have in Ramad Gan two religious parties. We have the, the religious Zionist party. We have the Sephardic party. They fight like cats and dogs. Chabad is not political. And the mayor decided, you know what? The best thing is be the left. He should take care of Chabad. So then he says to me, Atamakir Rabbi Mendi, you know Rabbi Mendi? I say to him, I don't know who, you know, there's always a Rabbi Mendi. There's always a Rabbi Mendi. Anyway, he gets him on the phone. We start schmoozing. Then he hangs up and he says, Ataydema Siti, you know what I did? This is the lefty the merits, the anti-religious party. They want to draft every yeshiva student in the world. They want to get rid of the chief rabbinate. They want to destroy religion in Israel. He says, Mendy, Rabbi Mendy came to me. Chabad has a very interesting program in Israel. Every year for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur for high holidays, they have a thing called the open synagogue. They get city halls, they get big malls, they're all closed. And he said, he came to me and he said, I want to use the city hall to make high holiday services. You know what I did? Me, Itzik, I'm the guy who did it. I arranged the high holiday services. And you know who spoke by Ni'ilah, the final service of Yom Kippur? It was me, Itzik. And I, uh, what I realized here was something for, so powerful. Because in, in Israel, where Chabad members go to the army, and my classmate, David Mizrahi, who sat on my table in yeshiva, spent a few years sitting on my table, tragically lost his life in a battle in the Yom Kippur War. In the, in the Yom Kippur War, during the Yom Kippur War, he was in a tank battle and tragically lost his life in the defense of Israel. Where Chabad is not a political party, but its members do go to the army, that they're active in the society, and they can be the bridge between the most secular and the most religious. Why? Because they are engaged in Israeli society, remaining true to their values, and the same thing, very part of that whole society. And that brings us to the, to the final big idea of the Rebbe which is what's the end game. So everybody who's in Detroit in the, middle of, in, the, in the middle of December thinks that the end game, that the utopia they want to get to is a condo in, my, in North Miami Beach or Fort Lauderdale or in Hallandale. And they think that is utopia. If I only can get down there. I did a Shabbaton some time ago. I was in, I think in Hallandale Beach, tall buildings, 50 stories high, full of Jews, all running away from that way. But that's not the final state of the Jewish people. 
The end game is that we believe in the coming of Mashiach. We believe in a transformational time where instead of, instead of seeing evil and instead of seeing negative things, we're only going to see holiness and goodness. And what the Rebbe's game, what, what the Rebbe was attempting to do was to prompt this thing to happen and to bring Mashiach. That we should transform the world to be a place of holiness, a place of goodness, a place of transformation. So we have six big ideas, my friends. Number one is that first and foremost is the idea of Abish Yisrael. We have to care about other people because of the inner spiritual qualities that every one of these people, ha these people have. Number two, that we have to serve God, not because we feel good, because we've internalized Judaism. And that only comes with heavy emotional lifting. There's no easy thing over here. Over here. Number three, we should all be leaders. We have to take responsibility and make, be the agents of change. And number, and number four, we have to stand up for our principles. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to, we have to stand up for our principles and, and not compromise Judaism for what, for what it, we have to, we have to not compromise Judaism. And number five, we have to be engaged with the world around us, remain true to who we are. And finally, we have to bring the world to a tipping point of goodness and holiness. I want to tell you two brief stories. And maybe after that, we'll have a little time for questions. I don't know if everybody's sleeping by now. I have no idea what's going on. Could be you're all snoring away and you've had a good time because I'm only seeing myself on the screen. I'm not seeing what's going on. But let me just, I want to share with you two brief stories, so to speak. And then we'll have some time for questions and maybe do the chat, whatever you want to do. I have a machutin. The machutin is the outlaws. I have a daughter who lives in Melbourne. Her father-in-law is a wonderful man, my dear friend, Sally Spigler. He runs a program called Chabad of Rara, which is Chabad of rural and regional Australia. And he runs all kinds of programs in small towns in Australia to take care of the needs and interests of the Jewish people. And if you want to watch a great film, I think it's on Amazon Prime. It's called Outback Rabbis. It's all about the work. It was featured on, on Australian TV. Let me tell you, watch out. You guys are bored. You're locked up in your homes. You can't go out. Read at watch Outback Rabbis. It's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful film about the work of Chabad of rural and regional Australia. Anyway, a couple of years ago, two Yeshiva Bukham travel from Melbourne and they go to a town called Ballarat. Now, Ballarat is a town which is, you know, it's in the, it's in the, what's his name? It's a few hours from Melbourne and it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was once. It was once a place within the 18, Australia had a gold rush in the 1870s, 1880s. And you know how a gold rush worked. The Jews rushed there and they come there and everybody else is digging for gold and they're digging, they're, they're selling for retail. And the Jews in Ballarat, they built a beautiful, beautiful synagogue. And today there's almost no Jews left in Ballarat. They barely, I don't even know if they get a minion on Yom Kippur, but the shul is beautiful. Built in the 1880s. There's other, other shuls. There's a shul in Melbourne built also during the gold rush. Stunning in downtown Melbourne, right next to the parliament. A beautiful little shul with gold leaf in it. They wanted to show off. We, the Jews, made it. So they come into town, and they visit the few Jews they know, and they decide to go look in the phone book to see if they can find any more. And a name pops up at them, Luria. Now, if you go into your synagogue, and you'll look at the prayer book that we use in Chabad shuls, it says, according to the custom of the great Kabbalist of Isaac Luria, who lived some 500 years ago. So they pick up the phone. They say, we are rabbinical students visiting from Melbourne. We like to see Mr. Luria. Are you Jewish? He says, yes. He says, can we come? Would you like us to come visit you? He says, yes. He says, we're coming. They get into the motorhome, the mitzvah tank, and you know how they travel down the street. The music is blaring. The police are chasing. They're coming. They arrive at his house, and they knock on the door. An old man opens the door and he says, where have you been? I'm waiting for you for 60 years. And what is the story of Mr. Luria? His mother went into Auschwitz, hiding a young child. And when she realized what really Auschwitz was, she understood there was no way this kid would survive. So what did she do? She somehow threw him over the fence to a farmer who put him in an orphanage. And miraculously, she survived Auschwitz. And after the war, she looked from one place to another, and she finally found her, 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 her son, and she decided she's moving. She got a visa to go to Australia. Now, Australia has a wonderful Jewish community with a tremendous amount of children of Holocaust survivors. But she didn't go to the phenomenal great Jewish communities in Melbourne or Sydney, and she didn't go to the smaller ones in, Bur in Perth and in Brisbane and Adelaide. She went to a place, she says, if the Nazis ever come again, they're never going to find me in Ballarat. And she told her son two things. Number one, number one, she told her 
that you are a Jew, and number two, you are a descendant of the holy of Isaac Luria. And on that day, Mr. Luria had his bar mitzvah, standing in his living room, and the boys took out the tefillin, and since then he's visited in Melbourne and reconnected with Judaism. He's getting a little bit older. He has a little bit of Alzheimer's. But here was a Jew who reconnected. Story number two. I think it's 2009, 2010, if I remember correctly. Prime Minister Netanyahu gets up at the UN and he makes his annual speech, which is always the same thing. Iran is a threat to the Jewish people and it is a mortal threat to the Jewish people. They have the same intents as the Nazis and they want to have nuclear weapons. And in the speech, he quotes, in that speech, he quotes, <clears throat> he quotes the Rebbe and he says, the Lubavitcher Rebbe told me that the UN is a place of darkness and if you light one candle and you tell the truth in a place of darkness, you can transform it. Now, what was the, what was the backstory? Just after he finished the speech in the UN, he went to the, to the 92nd Street Y and he told the backstory that when he was a young UN, he was a young Israeli ambassador to the UN. Uh, there was a member who had, he had been a commander of Tsayyid Matkal, which is one of Israel's top commando units. Those of you know, there was a Sabina airliner. He was, uh, that in 1971 or 72, was hijacked to Israel. I was a yeshiva student at the time. I remember from our yeshiva, we could see this airliner. And he was on the unit that took, that seized that airliner, took it back from the terrorists. So he was, uh, he was, a, he was eventually the unit, then he became a commander. And one of his, the soldiers, his unit became a Chabad follower. And he told him the Rebbe wants him to come to Simchas Torah. And Simchas Torah night, he comes to the Rebbe. And th that was the greatest night of the year. And 12 o'clock at night, the, the Simchas Torah celebration, what would happen is all the Hasidim would go all over Brooklyn. They would come back to Crown Heights. And while, the Rebbe, while they were out, the Rebbe would make a Fabrengen. And they switched the room. And about 12 o'clock at night, the Rebbe would come downstairs. And the Simcha Torah, the Simchas Torah celebration would begin, which would go to sunrise. So Netanyahu turns up at midnight. And he's put on the front of the stage. And the Rebbe comes in. And the Rebbe walks in. And he walks over to... Um, he walks over to, what's his name? He walks over to the Rebbe, he taps him on the back, and he says to the Rebbe that uh, I came to see the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says to see and not to talk. And for almost an hour, the Rebbe speaks to him. And what does he tell him? He tells him that he lives in a place of darkness, and he has to speak up for Israel, and he has to tell the truth, and he has to not be afraid. And Netanyahu, when he mentioned the Rebbe many, many years later in the speech of the, in the UN, he was referring to that experience. A day later, I pick up the phone and I call the man who I became very dear friends with. You know, it's interesting when you write a book, you get to interview a lot of people. And when you get to interview people, you get special friendships that you never believed you're going to have. And I called up a man who had been the, the I, had met, I had become friendly, very friendly with a man who had been the aide to five Israeli prime ministers. And he had been the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom and also to Australia. He wrote a very well-known book called The Prime Ministers. His name was Yehud Avneri, since passed away about two years ago. He was a very, very special Jew and one of the great treasured friendships of my life. So I called him up and I said, "New Rabbi Yehuda, did you hear about Bibi's speech? He tells me, yeah. He says, it's causing a ruckus in Israel. Most of the pundits, you know, you know, we have pundits and we have them on, and we have them on Fox, we have them on CNN, we have them everywhere. They're always telling us what we should think about certain things. He says most of the political machers in Israel are saying, you know what, that Bibi is going to do something soon to upset the Chabad community. So to placate them, he mentions the Rebbe from the podium of the UN. Now that speech is always every year the conference of the UN is around Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur time. So I called them a few days after this all happened a few days after Rosh Hashanah. So I said to him, no, Ambassador Avner, what do you think? He says, Davido, call me after Yom Kippur. He doesn't tell me a word. So two days after Yom Kippur, I pick up the phone. I call him up. I said, no, Rabbi Huda, I have no idea what he's going to tell me. He says, I went to Davin with Bibi on Yom Kippur. Now, we have to be truthful. Bibi is not the biggest Davener. Let's be honest. But Yom Kippur, he goes to Shul. Now, if you know where the prime minister's residence is in Israel, which is on Rechav Aza, on one side, Rechav Balfour on the other, it's right in the middle of Rechavia, and about 150 yards from the prime minister residence is the great synagogue, but because of security reasons, he can't go there. So we went to Davin in a small shul in the neighborhood of Rechavia. Now, there is a traditionalism. Bibi has an older daughter who's Haredi, and of his two sons, one of them is Shomer Shabbat. 
he observed Shabbos. In fact, he was the number two in the in the world biblical uh, 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 um, contest. He's very very well knowledgeable of Torah. But nevertheless, that's not what's important. So Bibi went to Daven in the small shul Rechavia, and my friend, the ambassador of ambassador of there, went to Daven with him. And we all know what the most important thing in Yom Kippur is in the afternoon is the break. Now Bibi didn't want to go home because it's a, a sight. It's, it's a security headache, you know, I'm, I don't know if you've ever seen him, but for whatever reason, a few times I met with, uh, with, with now a few times the last couple of years in his office with the groups and sometimes in the Knesset, he walks into a meeting with the Knesset with 20, 30 American Jewish leaders. He's got 10 guys surrounding him. It's just amazing the level of security. So to walk back in Rechavia, on Yontif, it's a pain in the neck. He stays in shul. So the ambassador is a man in those years in his 80s. He goes up to sit down and schmooze with him. Now, we know something about politicians. They don't always tell the truth. But it could be Yom Kippur afternoon or the break. They might be telling the truth. So Ambassador Abner turns to him and says, Bibi, finally, they schmooze, they cruise, they're talking, they're this, they're that. And he finally turns to him and asks the most of the question he came to ask him. He says, Bibi, ala Rebbe dibarte, you spoke about the Rebbe? And he says, Ken dibarte ala Rebbe. Unetan lita shlichut shlichayim. For sure I spoke to the Rebbe. He gave me my mission in life. This was a private four eyes conversation in Kippur afternoon. But why do I tell you these two stories? For, for important reason. Number one, what did the Rebbe tell Bibi? You need to be a proud Jew and you need to speak up for the Jewish people. And that's something we have to do, my friends, every one of us. We have to not be afraid of being assertive and being proud and being strong as Jews. And then the second thing is, we all know a Jew from Balarat. So you say to yourself, I'm going to Chabad, I go to JLI, I do this, I do that. And there's a Jew around the corner who never walked in the door. And if Rabbi this one will call him and Rabbi that one will call him, he'll say, I don't want to talk to you. But if you knock on his door and say, come with me to a class, or you know that it's Passover and he has no Passover Seder, or you know it's Hanukkah and nobody invited him or her to come and light the Hanukkah candles, you know that that person is disconnected to Judaism, you can be the person to reconnect. And when we stand proud as Jews and we connect one Jew to another, then we're truly going to one day usher in that period of time when the Shiach will stand together with us, that we'll stand together in Jerusalem with all the great Jewish leaders, leaders throughout the generations in a time of goodness and kindness, a time of peace and prosperity, in a time where sanctity and holiness will reign. Thank you very, very much. I hope you're all still awake. Rabbi Eliezri, thank you so much. As advertised, you were great. Before I have to, I want to welcome a couple of new family, uh, new communities and rabbis who are on the, on the, on, on this session. But I just want to ask you if you, and it's late, so, and, but you said you were going to talk about it. So if you could perhaps just talk for two, three minutes. You mentioned you wanted to talk about Chabad in Russia. And oh, I, I forgot to, about Russia. You know? I don't want to go too much longer, but also okay. I want, before you give your answer, I, I want to again just announce that today's lecture is dedicated in honor of Dr. Jimmy Phillips to have a refor shlema, a complete and speedy recovery. So give us your two, three little uh, shtick. Yeah, uh, a, a remarkable story. And, I, and I'm sorry, you know, you, you, it's a very strange thing giving a Zoom speech. It's my first Zoom speech. I like to know how many people are still awake, but nevertheless. Russia is, as I mentioned before, the previous Rebbe set up a Jewish underground in Russia, which nurtured Judaism all throughout that time. I heard a very fantastic speech from the Israeli Prime Minister, Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir. It was a 30, 30 days after the Rebbe passed away, there was a 30-day memorial service, and I was there in Tel Aviv. And he got up and he said I was, that he was in the Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service. Those of you who know his history, he was really, uh, he was in the Lechi, he was one of the major revolutionary groups, literally more revolutionary than Menachem Begin. But he joined the Israeli Secret Service, and in the early 50s, the Israeli government decided they're going to start trying to reach out to Russian Jewry through the embassy in Tel Aviv, in Moscow, which until 1967, they had relations with Russia. And they discovered in every city and town in Russia, there was already a Jewish organization underground run by Chabad. That kept going. And when, and when, and, and when what's his name? And when the, the Iron Curtain dropped, so that burst out. And we, Chabad began sending many, many emissaries to Russia, and Judaism is flourishing today all over Russia, literally all over the country. And, 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 I, and there's another important question, which is, how, does that, how do we relate to the Russian government, what goes on? 
And the truth of the matter is, while I don't like much of Vladimir Putin's foreign policy, the fact of the matter is he is a true friend of Jews. And I've heard this story from two people that have both told us bye bye Putin himself. I heard this from Rabbi Beryl Lazar, who happens to be, he got, came down with the virus, but I understand, I heard today that he's doing much better. He's in a hospital in Moscow, the chief rabbi of Russia. And I heard this from another individual, Lady Levayev, who both told me I heard this story from, from Putin. When he was a young kid living in St. Petersburg, basically a latchkey kid because his parents were working all the time, they lived in this apartment building and the same entrance, it was a religious Jewish family. And on Shabbos, he would sit at the table and he would see how this family lived and how they guided themselves and how their father was learning Talmud and eating chicken soup. So he always grew up with a love of Jews and appreciation of Judaism. So he is, well, I am troubled by much of his foreign policy. When it comes to Jewish affairs, he's a protector of Jews. So we're living in it. And what will happen after he, pass, after he fades from the scene? That's going to be a very good question. But right now, the political environment in Russia is that of protecting Jews. Judaism is going through a mind-boggling renaissance. There's a lot to talk about it. We could have another lecture for a whole hour about it. It's an amazing story. First of how Chabad ran the underground in Russia, which I'm going to detail a lot in my new book, Undaunted, which is the story of the previous Rebbe, and how this renaissance of Judaism is going on now, which is explained to a large degree in my present book, The Secret of Chabad, which, by the way, a shameless plug, you can buy it on Amazon. So, um, but th this is a remarkable story. Never in Jewish history has a country gone such a good transformation that today we have hundreds of rabbis all over the country from, from Nova Sabirs. I was in Nova, let me just finish with this. I was in Nova Sabirs. It is the capital of Siberia. Chabad in Nova Sabirs has a 45,000 square foot facility. It costs $5 million. 80% of the money came from the Jews of Nova Sabirs. And they have a school and they have a shul and a community center. And there's a thousand Jews who are members of that congregation have key cards to get into the building. Judaism is going through a massive renaissance all throughout the former Soviet Union. Thank you very much, Rabbi Eliezer. There's no question that uh, the success for, of Chabad is tremendous. And you're one of the insiders and I'm happy you were here to, to discuss it tonight with us with such energy. You could see the optimism, and I know everybody on, on line tonight really enjoyed it. And God willing, we'll go out to buy your book, The Secret of Chabad. It's available, as he mentioned, by David, Rabbi David Eliezri on Amazon. Rabbi Eliezri, I forgot to give him the formal introduction, but he's the director of Chabad of Yorba Linda, and he's the president of the Rabbinical Council of Orange County in California. And he's the unofficial spokesman of the Chabad movement. So thank you for joining us tonight.